Today we were to describe a new species of fish or bird or crab. The image that goes with it is confined by ground truth. And simply put, we know what it looks like, and it's up to the artist or the photographer to accurately convey that. In the fossil world, um, all bets are off. They're not restricted by anything other than their sense of, uh, of science. They study very hard, very accurately. Uh, they, they learn how to put the flesh on the bones. How would the skin look when it's draped over the flesh? But the outside external appearance is pretty much open to creativity. And most of the time, these artists have been free to create wondrous and beautiful and sometimes very fanciful imagery to help the rest of us imagine these lost worlds. Zoe Lascaz has done the world a tremendous favor by compiling in a very large and very beautiful book a recounting of the many attempts by artists uh, to get it right, or at least to get it done, so that the rest of the world could see what these worlds and the creatures might have looked like. Zoe's an art historian based in New York City, where she was born and raised, and where she spent countless hours roaming the halls of the American Museum of Natural History. She studied art history, studio art, and anthropology at Bowdoin College on the coast of Maine, and her thesis there focused on natural history dioramas, and in particular, how they relate to the paintings of contemporary artist Walton Ford. After graduating, Zoe moved back to New York and began covering the art world as a reporter for newspapers and magazines, including Art Forum and Art News, while maintaining her fascination with natural history. She eventually was able to meet Walton Ford in person, and they realized that a thorough and illustrated history of paleo art simply did not exist. Zoe spent the next four years researching paleo art around the world, finding lost and unknown works of art. The, result, the resulting book, Paleo Art, Visions of the Prehistoric Past, uh, a stunning compilation of images and writing, was published just last September. On behalf of the Natural History Museum, of Los Angeles County. I'm extremely pleased and honored to be able to introduce her to you this evening. Please join me in welcoming Zoe Lascotts. Uh, thank you so much, Jody, for that introduction. That was very kind. And thank you to Vanessa for organizing this talk and uh, the museum for having me. Also, I'd like to thank briefly everyone at Toshin, um, Jesse and James over there, and my editor, who's snapping photos right now, making me very self-conscious, Nina Weiner, who um, is, is really the reason this book exists. Um, she's you know, the kind of editor who will take your calls at 2 in the morning and listen very patiently for half an hour as you explain the latest in the saga of getting image rights from Daniel Burry's crazy Czech grandson. And uh, then tell you, you know, after Molly Walsh, that her house is on fire or that she just cut off half her thumb. And, you know, she should really go tend to that, but good job, Zoe. <laughs> so um, thank you for your patience, Tina. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. It's, it's really amazing and daunting to see so many people here. So thank you. Um, but, you know, I, I visited this um, museum before I even began working on the book. and. Um, remember zooming around just completely bowled over by the wall of direwolves and Mark Hallett's mural and the, and the freeze upstairs, not imagining I'd be talking here. So thank you so much. But um, you all came to this lecture, so you probably know what you're getting yourself into. But like Jody said, um, you know, paleo art is the practice of depicting prehistoric mammals and reptiles as they looked in life. Um, and I'm sorry if that seems basic, but over the four years I was working on this book, and a lot of people, their number one response uh, when I said I was working on paleo art was, you know, thinking I was working on Lascaux or Chauvet, and I'd have to apologize and say no, all of this is from the past 200 years. So, um, you know, also that's a very understandable mistake. So if you're in the wrong lecture, you can just leave and I'll understand. But for those of you who stay, we're going to talk about paleo art, and, um, you know, this is art that has been made effectively since 1830, and uh, there are artists and scientists, sometimes artists who are scientists, who look at fossil evidence and then imagine what those animals were like in life, uh, with their feathers and scales and skin on, as well as their environments, um, the weather and their habitat and their interactions with other animals and the lethal tar pits, um, like you see here, where we are now. 
And most of us have known what these animals look like since we were children. You know, a lot of five-year-olds can draw a triceratops. But we don't often pause to think about how we know what they look like or why we know what they look like. And, and that's one of the reasons I find Taylor art fascinating. That's kind of this cultural uh, blind spot, even though uh, images of paleo art are everywhere. You know, we see so many images of prehistoric animals, um, but we don't really tend to think about paleo art as a genre in the same way we do other branches of natural history illustration. You know, I think more people are probably familiar with um, the name John James Audubon than they are with Daniel Burian or Charles Knight or Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins, even though these people are the whole reason that we have any mental picture of prehistory. So, um, I mean, to start at the beginning, this is the image that launched the whole genre. Um, this is a small watercolor called Duria Antiquior, or a more ancient Dorset. And it was painted in or around 1830 by an English geologist and clergyman named Henry de la Beach. And, um, you know, it's, it's really quite delicate. It's no more than 12 inches, um, or 12 and a half inches on one side. Very small, and it's uh, tucked away in this drawer in a back room of a museum in, in Cardiff, Wales. And I remember um, visiting the museum and, and having it taken out of storage and just being, you know, knocked, knocked out because it's really sort of the stake in the ground. I think a lot of the sort of tropes that we have in our mind now about prehistory start here with this first imagining of, of that world that no one has ever seen. So you have more than 30 animals, it's a little hard to see, but more than 30 animals and, you know, they're swarming around, everyone's chasing each other or about to get eaten um, or bleeding or in the case of this one plesiosaur defecating, and, you know, it's total mayhem. And I think, you know, at least, at least for me, um, when I pictured prehistory, when I still do, you know, it's, it's not a bunch of, you know, T-Rexes sleeping or being sick or tired or facing the wrong way. You know, it's animals locked in combat. It's, you know, saber-toothed tigers squaring off with prehistoric humans, or it's sea creatures battling one another, and, uh, and volcanoes going off in the background. And, and a lot of that really starts here. So um, the amazing thing about this image, though, I think, is that you know, Henry, Henry de la Beach, he really wasn't um, trying to launch a whole genre when, when he painted this. He was just basically trying to help a friend. Um, he was born into money um, in, uh, at the end of the 1700s, 1796, and he um, had just gotten himself kicked out of a pretty prestigious military school in England um, for bad behavior. Um, and he moved, went and moved to Lyme Regis in 1816. And he, uh, he was wealthy, his father owned a pretty lucrative Jamaican sugar plantation. Um, and it was in Lyme Regis, this coastal town on the southeast coast of England, where he met a girl very, very different from him uh, named Mary Anning. And she was a few years younger and uh, born into poverty. Her father was a carpenter and a furniture maker and he uh, could barely support the family, and then he died, and definitely couldn't support the family. So uh, that job fell to her and her brothers, um, and, they, and they made a living uh, scouring the beaches in this area for different fossils. And the remains mostly of animals um, like ammonites, you know, these, which have these spiraling shells, and thalamites, which are the squid-like creatures who fossilize into these sort of shafts. And they would sell these to tourists um, at a time when, interestingly, most people didn't really know what fossils were. Um, I think it's really important to plunge oneself into the mindset of someone who's not familiar with the concept of extinction to understand some of this early paleo art. Because um, that idea was fairly new. Um, people had been sort of kicking around the idea that there were whole races of animals that no longer exist here and there, but it wasn't until 1796 that you get the first um, really airtight argument for prehistoric animals and extinction, and that comes from uh, George Cuvier, the eminent French naturalist, um, and he, he was the sort of guy, as I'm sure you all know, who, you know, you could hand him a skull or, or a little femur and he could tell you exactly what kind of squirrel it came from or what bird or what lizard, and he just had this incredible handling on comparative anatomy. 
So when uh, people brought him the bones of woolly mammoth from uh, Siberia, because mammoths do kind of pop out of the permafrost not infrequently, um, they brought him they brought him these mammoth bones and figured they were elephants, maybe elephants that escaped from Adrian's army as he was crossing the Alps. But Cuvier looked at them and said, no, these aren't elephants. Uh, these are something else. And because it seemed unlikely that such large animals could exist and still be walking around with no one seeing them, he arrived at the realization that these were animals that, that no longer were walking around. And that sort of opened the door to understand a lot of other bones that had been turning up, including the skulls of creatures like this ichthyosaur, which people had used to think were um, belong to crocodiles or maybe to dragons. You know, people have been finding fossils for millennia, but previously identifying them as the both dragons or giants. And so it's really around this time that people start grappling with the idea that there were, you know, these species that no one had ever seen. And um, Mary Anning was instrumental in, in our understanding um, of these creatures and sort of our getting to know them. She discovered the first ichthyosaur, what would become identified as the first ichthyosaur with her brother. She discovered the remains of the first plesiosaur, as well as the first pterosaur outside of Germany. And um, she would sell these fossils, sort of a, a proper gentleman of science, who would take them back to London and completely rip her off and take the credit for it. And, you know, for the usual reasons, being female, being poor, being uneducated, she didn't get any recognition. So Dela Beach, who was a uh, fairly established geologist at this time, uh, saw what was happening, and his sense of justice compelled him to sit down and paint this painting. So that's how we get Duria Antiguior in 1830. And um, by this time, people had found the remains of some other interesting new old animals. Um, this is sorry. Don't hold this back. This is the um, this is the first image of a dinosaur. And when I say dinosaur, again, this distinction is probably familiar to you guys, but um, I mean a, a group of terrestrial reptiles, so prehistoric marine reptiles, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, not dinosaurs, pterosaurs, not dinosaurs, just these guys. So this is the first painting we have of a dinosaur. It's of an iguanodon, and iguanodons were discovered by uh, this country doctor named Gideon Mantel, who. Um, it's just one of, one of those incredible characters. Um, one of my favorite parts about researching this book was the wealth of completely larger than life, insane people associated with this tradition. And, you know, briefly, he, he was born in some cottage and he barely got educated because he's a Methodist and he got apprenticed to a doctor and basically um, went from sorting pills to becoming a full-fledged surgeon and doctor in his own right. And his journals and, um, other other records reveal that you know he's seen more than 50 patients a day. He delivered between 200 and 300 babies a year. He really hit the ground running. He opened his practice right during the cholera and typhoid epidemic. So busy, busy. But still found time for geology, which you know he's one of those guys who makes you feel amazing about the hours you spend on Instagram. And <laughs> he um, so he was collecting fossils, you know, when he wasn't with his family or wasn't delivering 200 babies and. Um, one day he was visiting a patient, so the story goes, and either he or his wife found a tooth. And he believed it belonged to a large terrestrial prehistoric animal. And he got laughed out of town, including by Cuvier, who was wrong for once. Um, but eventually uh, was, you know, found more, more evidence that it was clear that this was a creature. So he, he called it iguanodon, which means iguana tooth, because its tooth looked a lot like the tooth in Iguanodon. Descriptive, it's not very mentionative. Anyway, um, this image uh, kind of launches, uh, you know, one of the two schools I think we see in 19th century paleo art. You can really sort of divide a lot of the English imagery into two camps. One of which is sort of orderly, civilized, primordial world, and the other is nightmarish hellscape. And we'll get to the nightmarish hellscape, but briefly, um, this image is interesting, um, and I have another one to show you as well, uh, because I think it really shows how paleo art became a vehicle for what was going on politically at the time in England. And this continued through the next century all over the world, in Russia and Germany. I think because people have never seen prehistoric animals, 
they're really especially convenient vessels for our cultural anxieties, our aspirations, our angst, um, and and that and that sort of starts here with these really overtly imperial images. Um, this iguanodon is sort of looking very content with himself on the banks of a river where all these other creatures are greeting each other very cordially, and you can see his tail looping into the background, practically to the horizon, and that's partly because um, Mantel scaled iguanodons up from the tooth, so if this is the size of an iguanodon tooth, and this is the size of an iguana, he basically did the same thing for iguanodon and figured they would be 100 feet long. Um, which is very big, and they're not, they're like 30 feet, but still big. And so he has it presided over this landscape, and it inspired a lot of imitations as well. Um, here's another sort of similar scene where he's reading these ichthyosaurs, like the king from his castle balcony. And, um, you know, uh, some of the writers um, who, who paired writing with these images, um, I think made the imperial colonial uh, aspects of the images very explicit in their writing. Um, this, this one guy, George Fleming Richardson, who was a curator and a geologist in, um, in the museum that Mantel eventually opened, he wrote about that other image. He said, the colossal iguanodon appears to reign undisputed monarch of the wild and wonderful scene commanding some mighty Nile, or still mightier Mississippi. So, you know, I don't think it's coincidental that he chose those rivers. These are areas in Egypt and the United States that are of colonial interest to England at the time, and it would be nice to think of yourself as an undisputed monarch of these wild and wondrous scenes, um, and not like everyone wants you out of there. <laughs> um, but, you know, for every idyllic image, uh, you get a Nightmare Shellscape. Um, and uh, that's actually not the one I wanted to show you, interestingly enough. Hmm. Okay. Well, we have some other images of, iguana of iguanas. Um, maybe I should just escape and find it. Sorry, no, that's going to be really awkward. Well, okay. <laughs> Take this as a surrogate. There are there are a lot of really gothic images like these, right, where you have these sort of vampiric bats swooping in like Dracula from stage right, and you have these monsters facing off. You know, plesiosaurs. We don't know that they had forked tongues. They gave them a forked tongue to make it more like demons and Satan. And the language gets gets very hyperbolic. Um, and unsurprisingly, so you know, the 19th century um, is a time of of complete and utter cataclysm. Uh, everyone's whole way of life was more or less being overhauled by the Industrial Revolution. Scientific discoveries were um, completely upending uh, commonly held beliefs. Um, you know, you get uh, the discovery of cells, as well as x-rays and radio waves, things that show that you know, the universe was composed of, of things and forces that, that can't be seen by the naked eye. And sort of unsurprisingly, um, you know, this, this gives rise to a renewed interest in dragons, which hadn't been so popular since the medieval period, but really came back in the 19th century. You get poems like The Fairy Queen and Gothic literature like Frankenstein and uh, Violent Penny Dreadfuls, which were really an expression, I think, of, the, of this sort of horror as well as, a, you know, reflective kind of impulse for escapism. And Mantel, interestingly, even compared himself to Frankenstein in, in one of his books, you know, he was writing about how big the iguana was, and, you know, he wrote that, in truth, I believe that its magnitude is here underrated, 100 feet. For, like Frankenstein, I was struck with astonishment at the enormous monster which my investigations had called into existence, and was more anxious to reduce its proportions than to exaggerate them. So, um, Let's see. You know, I'm so sorry we dropped an image or something, but um, we'll stay with this one. Don't get too bored. But um, hopefully it uh, it still applies. We can go to this one. Um, you know, this this sort of sense of the Gothic, I think, really enters into paleo art. Um, this is actually an American image. It's the first oil painting of prehistoric reptiles made in the United States, and it actually is in the public collection of a known pornographer here in the Los Angeles area. 
it's for sale for a million dollars if anyone's interested. Um, I just took the image rights. Um, but uh, in this, I think we can see um, you know more more of this kind of monster making because the scientists were in the same boat as the artists. You know, no one had ever seen these creatures, and although now we might be able to draw a T-Rex offhand or a plesiosaur, an ichthyosaur, a iguanodon, they didn't have a vast library of visual precedents upon which to base their drawings. So they, the scientists and the artists alike, kind of turned to a time-honored strategy of making new creatures. You make them out of other creatures. And so, you know, we see this in, in mythical creatures like dragons and harpies and hydras. Um, but it comes into play in paleoart. You know, this particular artist, Archibald Willard, gave his plesiosaur claws instead of paddles, even though it's an aquatic creature. And the scientists were describing these animals um, in really sensational language. Um, I think it's uh, particularly, you know, telling that William Buckland, this one um, very prolific scientist who did a lot of research on pterosaurs, in one of his seemingly sober scientific writings on this animal, compared it to Satan. And he quoted John Milton, he quoted Paradise Lost, um, because he was trying to prove the point that, that pterosaurs could probably swim, walk, fly, hang from things, probably some other things as well. So he thought it was relevant to quote uh, Milton saying, the fiend with head, hands, wings, or feet pursues his way, and swims or sinks or waves or creeps or flies. So, um, you know, this, this sensational language, it was just very casually woven into scientific dis discourse, so of course it made it into the artwork as well, but it wasn't just the artist running willy-nilly with this, which is the point I'm trying to make. But interestingly, you know, paleo art, um, it becomes a bit of a game of telephone, where you see in this um, image, for instance, there are these plesiosaurs, this little vague here, or ichthyosaurs rather, in the background spouting um, water. I mean, that's something that comes back from Duria and Tiquior. Um, I'm making it angry. Um, but you see that ichthyosaur sort of in the center blasting water out of its, out of its head. So um, people are, are copying those images, and that's something that kind of persists into the modern age and is something to look for. But um, for all the really nightmarish images, there are also some much calmer ones, um, more controlled ones, and ones in which artists were able to bring their own styles to bear. So, in you know many of these gothic hellscapes that uh, that we saw, you know they were artists, they were created by artists who were making apocalyptic biblical artwork in their spare time. You know when they weren't painting dinosaurs, they were painting the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah or the flood and the same shadows and bolts of lightning and, and volcanoes going off that they put in those paintings, they would put in their paleo art. This um, represents an alternate approach. This is by an Austrian artist named Joseph Kusefeg, and he uh, was a landscape painter. So his paleo art, I think, um, unsurprisingly emphasizes you know, the landscape instead of the animals. I mean, we have this one creature nestled there, but it's clearly not the center of attention like animals are in, in the work of his English counterparts. Instead, he lavishes a lot of attention on the foliage of the plants, and he was working with a paleobotanist, so that's part of it. But he really composes these images in such an elegant, tranquil way that I think um, we begin to see how paleo art becomes not just a vehicle for the cultural um, issues going on at the time, uh, or the political conditions, but also of each artist's personal preferences. You know, Joseph Kusefeg wouldn't have made the violent, bloody hellscape image because this is more his style. So our visions of prehistory really are determined by the style of the particular artist who's translating the material. And this image is, um, is really fantastic uh, because it shows um, the real stake in the ground for paleo art going public and becoming the kind of pop culture phenomenon that it is today. So if now we're used to there being newspaper headlines um, whenever a new T-Rex you know, comes out of the ground and is going to go on view at a certain institution, it sort of stems back to the artist who, who created these sculptures, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins. And to me, he's really 
the, the patron saint of all Pele art and, and of the whole way we exhibit prehistory. He was a showman and a visionary and a genius. And until these came along, Pele art was not particularly democratic. All of the images we were just looking at were mostly frontispieces or illustrations in pretty expensive scientific books that wouldn't have been of interest to a general reader. The, um, the first image we looked at, Duria Antiquior, when, when it was reproduced as a lithograph to benefit Mary Anning, um, it was sold for really exorbitant rates, you know, more than most lay people would have made in, in a month even. So it wasn't that accessible. It wasn't like kids were obsessed with dinosaurs in the 19th century until Benjamin Marhaus Hawkins came along. And so he, car you know, he made the first three-dimensional works of Paleoart until that of all on the page, but he was a naturalist and an artist who, um, who worked on the, the Great Exposition in Hyde Park in 1851, which brought together sort of all the you know, treasures and riches of the nation. And when, and when uh, the decision was made to recreate the exhibition permanently in Sydenham, which is a suburb of London, he was given the commission to create a special display that wasn't part of the original exhibition. It would be a series of man-made lakes and islands showing uh, the different periods of prehistory and its animals. So he spent several years working away on these creatures in a studio on um, the grounds of on the grounds of Sidon. They were open to the elements. You know, there were rats and birds scuttling around in the studio while he worked on these massive creatures. Each one required hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bricks and tons of cement and iron casing. They were enormous, but they are enormous. They're still standing there. And um, you know, he was also uh, really good at courting the press. So shortly before the opening of the exhibition, he even decided to have a dinner inside one of the dinosaurs. And uh, this is the invitation that was sent Dinosaur. to one of the guests. He hand illustrated each of them. This one is in the collection of the Natural History Museum in London, and then there's, there's one in Philadelphia. And then this is an image of sort of distinguished scientists of the day. It's hard to read, but it says Cuvier, Buckland, Mantel, the people we've been talking about in that ribbon across the top. And the menu was lavish. They went through about a half a million cases of wine and champagne, and um, the journalists all scuttled home and wrote about it. So he attracted a huge amount of press, and it's unsurprising that we get the first mention of a dinosaur in literature at this time um, in the opening pages of a Charles Dickens novel. So he really succeeded in bringing dinosaurs into the popular consciousness. And when the exhibition opened, uh, 40,000 people came to Sydenham on the first day alone, and 2 million people came there every year for the rest of the century. This was in 1854, so another, you know, 46 years. Lots of people saw these, and the few people who did make it in person would see reproductions of them. And so we see this kind of game of telephone happening, right, where you see that iguanodon in that posture, and then you see it again you know, perching in pretty much the same way in a illustration for a German pop science book and then in a Swiss tea card, which is very small, it's not this big. And, uh, you know, the boom in collectible cards at the same time, so that was another way prehistory made it into the public consciousness. But um, Benjamin Orhaus Hawkins did not stop there. Now, today, we're very used to seeing prehistoric animals articulated like these skeletons, you know, where the bones are placed on metal armatures in space, just like they would be arranged inside the living creature. But until Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins took his hand to say, that's not how they were exhibited. They were just exhibited embedded in the slabs of stone in which they were discovered, which was pretty dreary and kind of a big ask uh, to get the average person to sort of extrapolate what this animal might have looked like in real life when their bones are just sort of in a tangle in the rock. So he um, was the one who pioneered this form of exhibiting prehistoric animals, which was obviously a big deal. He did that in Philadelphia at the Academy of Natural Sciences, and it was a huge hit. They had to start charging admission uh, for all the people who wanted to see his hadrosaurus. Um, and then he went on his final real coup and contribution to paleo art was a suite of 18 oil paintings um, that sort of show the progression of prehistoric life through the ages. So this painting is called 
Cretaceous Life of New Jersey, and it was painted in 1877. And it's really one of my favorite paintings of the book, um, not, not just because it's, it's beautifully rendered in person in these sort of subtle shades of blue and violet and orange and green, but because how wildly anthropomorphic it is. Um, you, know, you have these guys making their exit as one of their friends gets attacked. Um, the, uh, these, two, these two animals, Hadrosaurus and Lalap, sort of became the American counterpart to Iguanodon and Megalosaurus in England. And, um, you know, the uh, Hadrosaurus here looks like he's sort of overdoing a Shakespearean death scene. <laughs> and this one, and if you look in the book, you know, has his tongue lolling out. It's very cartoony. And then these guys have sort of come in to enjoy the show. It's just um, really sort of fantastical at the same time that, uh, that it's pioneering and really brought us a long way to, to work like, you know, the murals that, that we see here in this museum, which are so helpful in, in you know, bringing these bones to life. But um, paleo art was obviously due for, for a kind of injection of realism, something to make it uh, that much more vivid and transporting. And that came in the form of Charles Knight, and um, here's this image again showing exactly where we are now as it would have looked like thousands of years ago. And I mean, if you compare these pictures, you know, this one, while I have a lot of affection for it, is just so stiff and stylized compared to something like this, which feels dynamic and active and like it actually exists in a physical world with light and shade and um, and like these animals are a little less flimsy, right? They sort of look built out, you know, from bone to muscle to flesh to skin. And one of the reasons uh, Charles Knight was able to do this, Charles Knight, by the way, he, he was an American. He was the first great American paleo artist and he was born in Brooklyn and uh, grew, up, he grew up drawing animals in zoos pretty much um, and really gained a deep knowledge of, of animal anatomy from there and from the Natural History Museum in New York and it was with the American Museum of Natural History that he would kind of hitch his wagon and, and become their, their main illustrator of prehistory, um, although this painting is for the Field Museum. But um, the way he was able to do paintings like these, and this is a really early painting from 1897, um, it's a small watercolor as well, but um, I think just so compelling because of uh, it feels as though he was observing this animal from life, and that's partly because he would sculpt these creatures out of clay after having involved conversations with the paleo paleontologist who discovered them and studied them. He would then place the models outside, and so he could really watch the way that sunlight would, you know, fall over the frill of this agathamus and. Uh, he also incorporated his uh, really intimate knowledge of living creatures um, into them. So you see these sort of crocodilian bumps around its flank and the way the tail sort of flattened in that way. Um, all really make it that much more visceral and immediate. And his crowning achievement came in a suite of chronological paintings in a way sort of modeled on the suite of chronological paintings that Benjamin Morehouse Hawkins created. Um, but at a much larger scale and, and really with his, you know, sort of superior abilities. Um, this painting is 25 feet wide. It's in the Field Museum. It's still on display, which is to their credit, you know, some museums sort of take down their paleo art as it gets older or dustier, but um, all of his masterworks are still up there and I really encourage everyone to go because this is just um, a really beautiful painting. You know, it has this sort of hazy, mythic quality, this timeless, a sense of confrontation and challenge, and it was obviously so influential, um, the basis for the showdown in Fantasia between the Stegosaurus and the T-Rex, as well as uh, for a lot of films. This is when dinosaurs first break into cinema, into Hollywood, fittingly enough, and um, so we see a T-Rex in the Lost World that's very closely, that's a, a silent film from 1925, that's a lot of fun. And, um, that, the, the creatures in that are really closely modeled on Charles Knight's paintings, as is the uh, T-Rex that King Kong fights in the original King Kong in 1933. The stop-motion animators in this one were big Charles Knight fans. And um, yeah, so, you know, Charles Knight really created the kind of institutionalization, if you will, of paleo art. You know, if uh, whoa, things have gone so out of order. Oh, no, it's fine. Um, but, uh, before, um, you know, if a lot
lot of this work was confined to natural history uh, books. Um, he was the one who inspired museums to start commissioning big projects um, following in the wake of the American Museum of Natural History and, and the Field Museum. So um, it's from here that we get major works in the history of paleoart like Rudolf Salinger's The Age of Reptiles, which is the largest work of paleoart ever created. That's at the Yale Peabody Museum. And um, as well as works in, in museums in, in France and Rennes and uh, on the walls of aquariums in Germany. And these, these works are in the book, but I kind of want to jump to probably my favorite artist in here, one of them. Who's Daniel Burian, and here's his riff on that that same confrontation. And I think in this painting, even you can tell, um, or you can see some pretty noticeable differences. How it's sort of charged with a more vicious sense of violence, a more sinister, tense atmosphere. Um, if this is a kind of you know dreamy, almost mythic version of what this you know uh, high noon of being prehistoric OK Corral would have been like, this looks like that, uh, that tyrannosaur might actually tear those animals apart. And I think that that is another case of um, an artist's biography as well as his political milieu um, influencing his paleo art and his paleo art becoming a vehicle for the time in which it was created. So Stanley Burian, he lived through two world wars, experienced the brief promise of the Prague Spring and then the you know, crushing Soviet invasion afterwards. And I think a lot of his works express this sort of Cold War tension. You have a lot of uh, animals sort of on the brink of conflict. And his works, to me at least, um, are infused with a sense um, and awareness that, that you know we could, that humankind could um, could destroy itself. And here are these big strong animals squaring off, but they went extinct as well. And there's a brutality to his work. Um, this painting is really searing in person. You can sort of smell the smoke coming off the fire and um, you know, see the grease on the fur or uh, hair of these Neanderthals um, as they're sitting around. And the title gives you a big clue to just how grisly this scene is. Um, they're, they're the cannibals of a certain cave. And so we realize that these chunks of meat and these bones that um, this one is sucking on are one of their own kind. And, so there's this, um, there's this barbarity that you really don't see in a lot of paleo art uh, prior to that. He really went there. And, and partly I think because he wasn't as fettered even to fossil evidence. While his, while his work was well researched, Burian had no access to fossils. You know, he was working uh, where he was working at that time in, in Prague and they did not have massive fossil collections. He looked at photographs of fossils and he looked at Charles Knight paintings and then infused it with his own sensibilities. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm pleased to have work by, by him in the book. They're not easy to find. They're, they're sort of scattered across the Czech Republic. And the keeper of his estate keeps a very firm hold on their, on their reproduction, but we were able to photograph all of them uh, for the first time, effectively, since the 1960s or so. And, um, so I think the color is a lot different, and the same is true for those Charles Knight paintings in the Field Museum. Um, and so those are kind of seen in a way we haven't seen them before. But I'd actually like to talk a bit about works of paleo art that have really never been um, seen, or very rarely seen, um, at least in the West. And, and this is one of them. This is sort of the stake in the ground with Russian paleo art, which was a whole um, area of this book that I discovered along the way and did not did not expect. Um, but it, some of these works became became my favorites. And this uh, I'm sorry to stretch out. Um, hopefully you can see in the book or you know pretend you're gonna buy one and flip through it or something. But um, it's it's a really good fold out and uh, and worth folding out because um, it's kind of this whole tableau that in real life is installed around the frieze of a circular room in the State History Museum in Moscow, which is this really over-the-top, frilly building on Red Square, and it chronicles the history of Russia from prehistoric times to pretty much the revolution, um, a lot of Tsarist treasures and not much after that. And, and basically, um, here, they, got, they commissioned an artist um, 
who had a background in, in social realism. So uh, his name was Vasily Vosnetsov. He was a, he was a um, friend and a uh, peer of Ilya Repin, um, who was another painter who at the time took a great interest in the lives of commoners, beggars, booksellers, clerks, and um, you know this is in the wake of 23 million serfs being emancipated in Russia in 1863, I think, ish. And, uh, and he's painting this um, about 15 years after that. And um, there was a whole movement at the time that was devoted to really uplifting the uneducated common man and showing his resourcefulness and skills and ennobling him um, versus you know, more wealthy patrons. And so you sort of see that in the beginning of the mural where um, there are a lot of industrious early humans. This is really a little too blurry, but check it out. Um, later, there's you know, people sort of carving bone and making ceramics out of mud and hauling dead bears around the camp and shooting birds. And this guy who's posed like a sort of latter-day Hercules. But then things start to get a little darker. And they go on a mammoth hunt and end up just um, you know, eyes wide, you know, red mouths, uh, tongues flailing, attacking this mammoth that they've trapped inside a pit and stoning it to death, and there's dead carcasses lying around. And I think that, you know, in the context of pre-revolutionary Russia, it sort of presages, you know, the foment of uh, certain violence that was brewing at the time, and it's not completely separate from the environment in which it was, in which it was created. And, Sure enough, you get the Russian Revolution in 1917, and um, a little before that, actually, it was the first museum in the entire world devoted to evolution, and to Charles Darwin was founded in Moscow. It's called the State Darwin Museum, and it's um, a very strange place that I recommend everyone go. But they have a lot of paleo art, including uh, the first, um, they were at least the earliest images I was able to find. Um, of, of dinosaurs in Russia, of reptiles of any kind, really. Uh, but um, Vatagin, the, the artist who made these, Vasily Vatagin, he was he was another sort of established naturalist of modern animals, and then he turned to uh, to prehistoric animals. And he was quite cautious. He didn't want to guess at the colors of um, reptiles because he couldn't know what color they were. So he stuck with what he knew: blood is red. So there's a lot of red blood and everything else is gray. Um, but he kind of paved the way uh, for um, a man who was his protege and then um, eclipsed him, um, which is uh, maybe my favorite artist in the book. I mean, he's just so out there. His name is Konstantin Konstantinovich Florov, and he, uh, he was um, a scientist primarily. He studied zoology but did not let that get in the way of his paleo art, which regularly um, completely departed from scientific imagery. Um, he just took great liberties with animal anatomy. Um, and instead, I believe seeing these colors is really, uh, in these paintings is really reveling in color and pure form, um, which was a radical thing at the time. You know, during the, uh, the Soviet period, and these images were made in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, um, subjectivity was discouraged, and non-didactic uh, imagery was discouraged, and anyone who identified as, as a fine artist and worked in that capacity officially was under pretty close state scrutiny. So that's how you, of course, get all the images of cheerful steel workers and happy laborers and peasants that we associate with um, Soviet Russia. Um, and, in, and I think that paleo art really provided an outlet for a lot of artists to create less uh, boring and, and didactic imagery. You know, under Stalin, you were supposed to look at a painting and walk away knowing exactly what to think. But if you look at this painting of this prehistoric mammal, I mean, what's didactic about it? We know that this animal drank water, okay. But mostly it's open-ended, and really the point of it seems so much more to be the color and these sharp diagonals, and you know, especially the complementary colors, the blue and orange, you know, he's, he's sort of reveling in paint for paint's sake, and the way color vibrates on your eyes. Again, there's this blue and orange, and this lavender and gold, and, I really love this painting. Um, both this and the one before it are executed on just these flimsy scraps of cardboard. 
Um, and they're in a vault in the state in the state Darwin Museum, and um, I don't think it's been that widely reproduced. Uh, but they're they're really great testament to the way that paleo art, at least in this political context, could kind of upend the normal um, hierarchy between fine art and, and illustration. You know, I, I mostly write about um, contemporary fine art, and of course, the art world is very stuck up about itself, and there's um, quite the you know understanding that well, there's fine art, and then there's illustration or other forms of visual culture, like advertising, which is you know didactic. You're supposed to know what to buy and, and how to buy it. But here, in fact, fine art became so much more uh, dull and prosaic, and uh, instead it was illustration where artists could really let their imaginations wander, and where we get to let our imaginations wander. So there are a number of images by him in the book that um, I'm really pleased to have in there. They're just, uh, I think, really transporting and, and, and wacky, too. I mean, his color is crazy. Um, but, you know, for, for all of the restrictions of the, of the Soviet Union, um, they're also under Stalin with a huge culture of monumental decoration and public adornment. So, of course, you get a huge campaign of statuary in the, in the various capitals. But you all, and, I mean, if you go into the subway stations in Moscow, there are chandeliers, and there's brass, and there's bronze, and there's mosaics, and there's marble, and there's candles. And it's really, um, elaborate and over the top uh, in, in a way that I think helped some of the more grandiose uh, paleo art projects that you find anywhere in the world, including this mural, which is, um, not to be too much of a New Yorker, but twice the length of the subway car. This is how they think of it. It's very, very long. It's about 92 feet long. And it's really kind of uh, an image as fairy tale like as some others are nightmarish. Um, it's all made very small here, of course, but there's um, this sort of beautiful Clabonet water lily action towards the bottom, and these pterodactyls swooping under rainbows and dipping into the golden water. And everything's, um, you know, really gorgeous and decorative in this uh, obviously non didactic way, but just on a, on a massive scale. It's a fresco, and they went through, I think, several thousand eggs to paint it. And the local grocers were apparently looking at the artists like they were crazy or very hungry. Um, <laughs> but uh, that is in the Orlov Paleontological Museum, in, also in Moscow, uh, which is an amazing institution. Just every inch of it is covered with low-relief ceramics and cement, all prehistoric themes, even the grates of the doors and the windows are shaped like pterodactyls. The hinges on the doors are shaped like plesiosaurs and sort of a geometric M.C. Escher way. They all walk together. It's really out of control. And um, they have one of the real, really like crown jewels, I think, of Paleo Anywhere, which is this giant, giant low-relief ceramic. So what's hard to see in this image is that it's concave. It sort of curves around like this and that every fragment of it is raised and textured and carved, and it's called Tree of Life. It's by um, an artist named Belashov, who um, was able to uh, to create this on, on a massive scale, and I do just want to give a sense of the size, because it doesn't always come across in pictures, so if you'll bear with me, I'm going to go to this video. Um, this is me in the museum walking up the stairs. Um, and this is how big it is. I mean, it's just a really staggering thing. And it also has mirrors installed at the top. Here you'll see, uh, uh, oh, look at there. Right, so there's the mirror, so, and there's another one at the bottom as well. So it looks like it's reflected infinitely into space. It's really out of control. It does have this kind of Soviet tenor to it, where it culminates with this human mother and child. This is where we've all been going. And then you can't really see, but these um, spaces on either side of her have these um, little cityscapes and indications of civilization. There's some grain and ears of corn on one side, and then the silhouettes of nuclear power plants puffing away. <laughs> so, uh, we've arrived. So, um, so that's uh, a, 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 a pretty amazing work that I think shows um, kind of paleo art at its and it's full expressive uh, qualities, and um, let me get back into the presentation. Uh -huh. okay. And this is 
um, just the last image that I that I wanted to talk about. Um, it's a detail of a larger painting by Ellie Kish, who's a Canadian artist, and she painted this in uh, 1976. It's called The Extinction, and um, it was around the time that uh, scientists, from what I understand, were, were thinking a lot about um, how the dinosaurs uh, died out, and obviously there's still a debate over that. Um, here we see a supernova waning in the sky, and this frozen forest and the carcass of this unfortunate animal. But interestingly to me is that she painted this around the time that climate change science was really coming into its own, and that humans were grappling with whether we might be due for another uh, mass extinction on this level, one that might obliterate our own species. And um, it kind of ties it for me poignantly into what was going through the minds of these 19th century uh, thinkers as well, um, the people who were first contending with the idea that um, extinction existed. Um, you know, now we're so bombarded with news reports of vanishing species, of you know, pandas disappearing, of our own species being on the chopping block. It's hard to imagine what it would have been like for an educated person to um, grapple with evidence that there were whole species of animals that no longer exist when you've been raised thinking that every animal or every kind of animal that exists now has all been created on the same day and would be around forever. And so would we. And so it's, there's a lot of terror, I think, that finds its way to the early works of paleo art, and that, and that anxiety is still with us. And I think paleo art is a poignant way of, of exploring that and coming to terms with that. And I think it's why, um, you know, dinosaurs at all are, are appealing. I think, you know, uh, I think Freud wrote about how they are actually a way for kids to deal abstractly with ideas of death before, when it's a little too early to think about yourself dying. And I, I, was, I was doing an interview with a, a German um, journalist for this book, and she told me that her son had actually asked her when she had the book at home if he was going to get killed by a meteorite. You know, I think this was great. Um, this really compelling way in which we see ourselves as dinosaurs. You know, they're, they're so other, they're reptilian and monstrous and creepy, but, um, you know, they're also these sort of powerful but valuable characters. And, and in that, we can, we can see ourselves and our own vulnerability. And um, the, other, the other thing that attracted me to this project was that paleo art is vulnerable. And uh, if, if this book does anything, I'd, I'd love for it to be to save a few works of paleo art because in the course of my research, um, I saw so many pieces that only are with us because uh, these kind of loyal museum employees quietly fish them out of dumpsters. You know, a lot of institutions over the years, um, some of course keep their works of paleo art display, like the museum here. Um, and however anachronistic they get, you know, they'll keep them on the walls as a, as a sort of chapter in uh, the story of, of humans understanding prehistory, like the Peabody Museum. Other museums, however, um, get a new director who comes into the storage unit one day and says, why do we have all of this dusty, inaccurate stuff um, out? So, um, and, and that's because, you know, paleo art is not really valued like fine art um, as, as works of art um, in, the, in and of themselves. They're more seen as these documents and just translations of ideas, at least by, by certain people. So I, I saw a work by Charles Knight even, um, who, you know, if there's anyone who you think you'd keep around, it would be Charles Knight. You know, that image, um, that, that work, it hangs in an in a, um, office of a museum employee who, who got it out of the trash. So. Anyway, this is, this is all to say that um, paleo art, I think, is vulnerable in ways that uh, other forms of illustration aren't. And uh, that was really one of the, the pleasures of doing this project, to, to kind of explore it in, in an art historical way. I'm, I'm not a paleontologist, and um, the accuracy of these images doesn't interest me at all. Um, but sort of their you know, when they get right, it's great, but their departures from reason are as interesting to me. And uh, that is the kind of art.
photographers with um, experience by uh, photographing fine art because it is a very specific skill set. You know, I, I had this one uh, horror story in Moscow where I was trying to get this thing photographed and you know, it's reflective, it's concave, it's giant and you have to do it in pieces. And the guy who's recommended to me there um, was a very storied war reporter. He was this very handsome uh, Englishman expat who had gone over to report on the Chechen war and never gone back. And, he pretty much figured that because he could take pictures while the building he was in was being shelled, he could take pictures of a painting or, or a mosaic. And, um, you know, he, he's an amazing photographer, but did not, it, it's, it's more complicated than pointing the camera as a piece of work. You have to get the lighting very specific. So, um, you know, he, I actually hired him to go photograph that mosaic, and he went in and was like, nope. And so then it was a big hunt to find someone with that experience. and. Um, really just a lot of research. I asked him for contact who pointed me towards other people who were, had worked with other people and eventually I found a guy who had done work for an architectural magazine in, in Moscow and some other uh, architectural magazines. So he had the skill set to photograph that thing and he was such a pleasure to work with, I ended up sending him on the road. So all the Burian paintings in the book, um, there are about 30 of them I think and they were at four, five different locations. Um, some None of them were. One, one location was in Prague, one was just outside the city, but most were in some, some weirder places, including a zoo in eastern Bohemia um, that required taking several trains to get to. The third train you'll take, they kept getting whittled down, but the third train I took was just one car that pulled into the station. <laughs> oh my god. So, so I would go and do the research and say, oh, okay, uh, these are the important things, blah, 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 but then I would, I would hire a photographer to go photograph them afterwards. So Yuri, the, the Russian photographer, Yuri Pullman, he, um, I flew him from Russia to Vilnius, Lithuania, where he picked up his assistant, and then they, they went on a road trip around the Czech Republic. They just drove to all these places and photographed them. In places like in New York, it was simpler. In places like LA, it was simpler. I flew a, new, a photographer from New York to uh, Chicago to photograph the Field Museum ones. Um, and then a lot of the images in uh, 19th century books, I would buy those books and then have them scanned at the Toshin offices in Cologne. Please. Uh, is there field art burgeoning from, say, Asia, China, or South America, mainly Western Europe and North America and Russia? Definitely. Um, because I sort of focused the book on the years 1830 to um, 1980, 1990-ish, mm -hmm. um, there were fewer artists uh, from those other places working at the time. Now there's tremendous paleo art coming out of China, particularly mm -hmm. because you have so many incredible fossil discoveries yeah, there in recent years, and as you're so clearly aware, and, and South America as well. But um, you know, the book focuses sort of on the origin story of the genre, mm -hmm. and um, and at that time, you know, they weren't uh, you know concentrating right. paleontological research there, so. I think you could definitely do a sequel with some no, you amazing can, artists. You can so. do it. 